Hi everyone. Thank you very much, Adam, for inviting me. Thank you to Wharton for hosting me. So uh, my name is Adam Alter. I'm a professor of uh, psychology and marketing at NYU at Stern. And this book is about addictive tech and the rise of addictive tech and the role it's playing in our lives, the outsized role. And I became interested in this topic about three years ago when two things happened. The first thing that happened was I read about this guy. This guy's Dong Nguyen. He's a Vietnamese game developer. And he designed a game that I could not stop playing. Um, this is the game. I don't know if any of you have played this game. Anyone having flashbacks? This is Flappy Bird. It's the simplest game in history. All you have to do is make the bird not fly into walls. It's incredibly straightforward, but it's also massively addictive. So Nguyen designed this game, and it was, it was very, very popular. It took a little while to take off, but when it did take off, it did very well. At its peak, he was earning $50,000 a day in ad revenue which is not shabby if you're an independent game designer. So he designed the game and I started playing it and I found it very hard to stop. And I got curious about it and I wondered if there was something about the game that made it hard to resist. So I started to read some of the reviews for the game and they were really interesting. So they, they were this interesting mix. What you see here is, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a glowing review. Five stars is what you're looking for, but it also is killing this person which is a weird, it's a really weird tension. So this person says, Flappy Bird will be the death of me. Let me start by saying, do not download Flappy Bird. Keeping in mind, this person gives it five stars. Um, and they basically go on saying, I went to the app store, I downloaded it. That was my first mistake. I played it once and said, okay, just one more time. Uh, that one more time never ended. I don't sleep, I don't eat, I'm losing friends all because of Flappy Bird. <laughs> so tremendous game. Um, and. What happened in the end was Nguyen had a conscience. He grew a conscience, and he felt so bad about it that despite the massive ad revenue, he pulled it from the App Store. It was the number one game on the App Store. He pulled it, and he basically tweeted, I'm sorry, Flappy Bird users. I will take Flappy Bird down. I cannot take this anymore. It is not anything related to legal issues. I just cannot keep it anymore. I also don't sell Flappy Bird. Please don't ask. People were desperate. There was like a black market for Flappy Bird. <laughs> so something here was going on with this this game, and I played it for hours and hours on my iPhone. Now, the second thing that happened paired with this suggested that there was something systemic going on here. And what that was, was I started to read a little bit about how Steve Jobs thought about the iPad as a delivery device. And when he introduced the iPad in 2010, he said, what this device does is extraordinary. It offers the best way to browse the web, way better than a laptop, way better than a smartphone. It's an incredible experience. So that's obviously a glowing review of the product. But at the same time, when he was asked in 2012 what he thought about the iPad with respect to his kids, this is Nick Bilton, a tech writer for the New York Times. Bilton said to him, so your kids must love the iPad. And Job said, they haven't used it. We limit how much tech our kids use at home. <laughs> so on the one hand, he thought it was a wonderful device. That's what he was telling the world. But on the other, he was really concerned about having this device in his home. He didn't want to give it to his kids which is concerning, perhaps because he knew that if they got hold of Flappy Bird, it would be the end of them. So something is going on here. And what's interesting is beyond Steve Jobs, other tech titans have said similar things. So this is a school called the Waldorf School, school of the Peninsula, which is uh, in the Bay Area. And there's something really interesting about this school. It's one of the few schools around the country now that mandates a complete tech ban. No computers, no iPads, no iPhones, nothing. But what's really interesting about the school is that 75% of the kids there have parents who are sec Silicon Valley tech execs. So these are people producing tech and yet saying that their kids should go to a school where there is no tech. They realize that something is going on here. And you know they're right to have those concerns. There's a lot of research suggesting that these concerns are well-founded. Here's one of my favorite pieces of evidence. A whole lot of people of roughly your age in their 20s and 30s were asked, if you had to choose between a broken bone and a broken iPhone, which one would you choose? This is what they said, 54% <laughs> said a broken phone, which left 46% saying broken leg. And what's really interesting about this is when you watch them make the decision, even the people who say I'd rather have a broken phone, agonize. They spend time, it's not like a, a snap decision where it's easy for them to make because these devices are so instrumental in their lives. They know that not having them will be a really massive psychological pain for them. Um, and so you, you have this crazy statistic. One of the reasons people say this, by the way, is they say, while I'm recovering from my broken bone, at least I'll have my phone to keep me company. <laughs> so that's concerning. But let me give you a sort of bigger, more reliable data set. Uh, this is a program called Moment. You can all download Moment for your phone. Some of you may have it already. It's designed by a guy called Kevin Holesch from Pittsburgh. 
And he designed it because he felt that he was spending too much time on his phone. It measures how long you spend on your phone every day and how many times you unlock your phone. So basically, he A-B tested it with his friends, and he asked them, how long do you think you're spending on your phone? And his friends said about an hour and a half on average. Turns out they were spending an average of three hours a day on their phones, which is pretty striking. And what that means is if you look at the waking hours in the day for the average person, the dark blue is the hours we spend at work. The light blue is the hours we spend doing survival activities like eating and bathing, which leaves the white bit. And that's the bit that you can do lots of interesting things with. Or you can fill it with the black bar, which is how long we spend on average on our phones now. So that's, we're left with that little sliver of white to engage with other people, to have social interactions, to talk to our loved ones, to do the really important things in life. We're not leaving ourselves much time to do that stuff because phones get in the way, three hours a day on average for people. So this is a problem. Now, all of this falls under the banner of behavioral addiction. Behavioral addiction is basically the drive to engage in some behavior that's rewarding now, but that has really strong negative consequences in the long run. And they can be in a lot of different spheres. They can be physical, mental. So physical, if you do, say you play games for 45 days straight, as one person I'm going to tell you about did. That was bad for him. He put on 40 pounds of fat because he didn't move. Um, mental, social, financial. Social because our relationships break down, and financial, obviously, because people overshop and they don't work as much as they should. And there are a lot of different kinds of experiences that fall under this banner. There are things like um, compulsive use of phones, email, social networks, uh, video games, overwork, overexercise, compulsive shopping, gambling. And what's interesting about this is if you want to know how many people in the population at large have at least one of these issues, you may feel that you have one of them. There was a study published in 2011. Uh, Mark Griffiths, a British researcher, found that as of 2011, 41% of all adults have at least one behavioral addiction. And he predicted that number would rise. And I'm sure now, six years later, that it has risen significantly. It's probably over the 50% mark because now iPads have really taken a hold and when you ask people who work in behavioral addiction treatment, they all say the biggest thing to happen in behavioral addiction was first the advent of the iPhone and then second the advent of the iPad. So I think that number has probably risen. So let's talk about what you can do about this. Um, there are a few things that probably won't work. Cold turkey is one of them. <laughs> if you search cold turkey, there actually is a cold, like a, a cold turkey. You have that option there on Google Images, which is nice. Um, so cold turkey doesn't work for a lot of reasons. One of them is that you can't function in the world and not use tech. It's just very hard. You can't work, or it's very hard to work. It's very hard to travel. It's hard to just go about the business of everyday life, not to mention the social consequences of not using tech. So cold turkey is tough. Also, um, if you stop using tech, the motives that that tech is, is uh, dealing with for you. So let's say you, you are looking for social connection. If you don't get that social connection through tech, you're going to need to find it somewhere else or soothe yourself some other way. So there's some evidence that if you try not to use tech, just going cold turkey, you end up developing other forms of addiction to compensate. So that's dangerous. The other thing you can't do in the long run is one of my favorite techniques. This is Manish Sethi. And uh, he's a tech entrepreneur, entrepreneur who lives in New York. And he went on Craigslist and he advertised for a position that he paid uh, a significant sum of money, this woman was paid to follow him around. And when he did something he didn't want to do, she was paid to slap him. <laughs> so, so she punished him every time he opened his Facebook or his email. And here you can see that, that form of punishment in action. He ended up designing a device that I, he sent to me. It costs $500. You wear it on your wrist. And you can program it to give you a zap when you do something you shouldn't be doing. It is so incredibly powerful that I hit the roof when I first used it, so I've never used it since. But people who do use it swear that it works really well. But I don't think that's a long-term solution either. So here are some things you can do. One of them is basically a series of techniques known as behavioral architecture. It's the idea that just as an architect creates a building or designs a building, you can design your own life in such a way that you can minimize harm and maximize good. So here are some things you can do with respect to tech. One of the things you can do is for part of the day, remove it from your life completely. So what I've tried to do is between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m., I put my phone in a drawer and I don't go near it. Same with my iPad. I try not to use the TV. Um, so I try to remove tech altogether for part of the day. That's one option. But some tech is going to be with you. And so you need to make sure that you 
do whatever you can to minimize the pull of that tech. So here's one thing you can do. I don't know if you heard that, it was subtle, but there was the ding sound that a lot of us have when we get a new email. And that for us ignites a set of responses that makes us feel really good most of the time. It's a sort of reward response. So one thing to do is to turn that sound off. That's pretty effective. Another thing you can do is turn off all notifications on your phone because what you're doing then is you're resting control from your phone and you're, you're taking it yourself. You're deciding when to go to the phone because if you have push notifications, your phone is guiding you, which is the opposite of what you want to happen. Another thing to do is to make sure that your homepage on your phone doesn't have any of those addictive apps for you. If it's Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or whatever it is, remove them, put them in a folder in the third or fourth page and make sure that you type in the search bar the name of that app because that's a willed behavior. That basically means that the only time you will go to this device is because you, you've willed it, you've decided that it's something that should happen. It's not that the, the app or the icon is reminding you to, to check it, which you'll do reflexively. Uh, and the fourth thing you can do, uh, this is a little small, but if you look at the bottom there, this is a Facebook post. You can see this person has 10 likes, three shares, and seven comments. There's a, a, a program now known as a, the Facebook Demetricator, which removes all the numbers. So if you look at what happens when you activate the Demetricator, it doesn't give you numbers, it just tells you that these things have happened, but not how much. And so you don't obsessively return to check over and over and over again. It's proven to be pretty effective. So those are some things you can do. Um, also, at the cultural level, there are some things we should do. And this is a bigger conversation, obviously. One of them is exemplified in the behavior of this design firm in Germany. They have tables that are tethered to the ceiling. And at 6 p.m. every day, no matter what you're doing, the tables rise to the ceiling and the place, <laughs> the place turns into a yoga studio. So you'd better be finished with your work. You have no option. So that's one thing we could do, is sort of mandate that work ends at a particular time or do our best to do that. Another thing we can do is, you know, a lot of businesses, when I tell them this, say, we obviously want our programs to be addictive because that's how we compete in the marketplace. Well, here's one solution. These 100 calorie packs in the food industry are very popular. People will basically pay more to buy less food because what they're paying for is self-control. They're outsourcing self-control to the companies that make the food. Now, if, if social media platforms offered a slightly more expensive, I guess they're currently free, but if they said for 10 bucks a year, you can get a version of this platform that has fewer of the hooks that will addict you. Effectively, you're resting, they're resting self-control from you and doing it for you. People would pay more for that. So the businesses might be happy and you would get a better version of the program. That's one option. And finally, there are people who are known as design ethicists at these big companies. And a lot of them believe there should be a Hippocratic oath for designing tech. That just as doctors are supposed to do no harm, when you're designing tech, you should make sure that you consult with behavioral experts who ex explain to you what you should be doing to minimize the addictive hooks that are conveyed in these products. And the last thing is to understand what it is that makes you addicted in the first place, because addiction isn't just about that rise in dopamine. It's not just about taking the drug or doing the behavior. It's what it does for you. It's what it soothes. And this is Isaac Weisberg. He's uh, a gamer from way back. He's a straight A student. He did very well in school. He played football. He was kind of the, the all American guy. And Things went wrong for him when he started playing World of Warcraft. Um, there are 100 million people who've played this game and signed up for accounts. Half of them have developed addictions. It's probably the most addictive experience in the world. Um, and Isaac had a real problem with this. He's the guy who spent 45 days playing. And the key for him was to work out what it was that was driving that. So some people play World of Warcraft because they're bullied. And it allows them to choose a really dominant avatar. And so they do really well. They feel better because they've got a dominant avatar that conquers missions and does, does really well on missions. Um, other people are lonely and so they form guilds of friends on the platform and for him that was the main thing. And so he realized that if he could cultivate social, a social life outside of the game, he, that addiction would, would wither away and that's what happened. For other people it's about low self-esteem and conquering quests. It makes them feel efficacious. And so the key is to work out what is the underlying psychological issue that you soothe with these behavioral addictions. And the biggest thing, I think, of all is nature. It's the anti-behavioral addiction. It's the perfect place to go. It's sort of anywhere where you go where you have no idea what year it is, is a good solution. And so I think that's, that's the biggest cure of all. Thanks very much.